amendment to strike both this number six sewer main update and number seven director's report out because there's no need for either of them having gotten them and having the director not being present and providing a report. So I would second that. Now, all those in favor? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Okay, so we have our agenda. Next, we have a approval of the minutes from a 627 meeting. I move the approval. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Next, we have a public forum. So, first up tonight, we have Jack Hansen. Welcome. Is it doing us? Is it better to do it now or on the item? We're going we're gonna to do it now. Um, okay. Because the item will get um, fairly shortly. We said an update on it. Okay. Um, how long do I walk in and out? Um, uh, I, I don't know. How much time do you need? <laughs> uh, remember, you want to get out. Of I, want, I want to have public forum. I, just, if I'm going on too long, just say it up. Maybe say, can you keep it to three or four minutes? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I'll try my best. Um, Great. Well, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And I think the two main pieces that I want to emphasize or hit on this. Um, one is just what I was talking about last night as well, which is the timeliness piece, the importance of getting this framework in place quickly. Um, from my experience on council, a lot of these, these key climate policies are, are just simply taking far too much time and energy um, to get past. And there's, there's a number of climate policies that we need to get past very quickly. So taking that urgency and, and finding ways to speed up this process. And if, if it doesn't leave the committee tonight and move into ordinance committee, I would schedule a meeting to complete the item rather than waiting another month because it's still gonna have to go through ordinance, back to council, et cetera. Um, in terms of the policy itself, um, I think what I would emphasize that I think you all can and should change is around the renewable natural gas piece, um, particularly for new construction. I don't think it makes any sense to be building new construction with this fossil fuel infrastructure that, if built, is largely going to be pulling um, natural gas, not renewable natural gas from Vermont gas's infrastructure. That's largely what's gonna happen if a new building is built with gas infrastructure. That's what they're gonna be pulling. They can pay into this renewable natural gas system, but, and support potentially, you know, if the program is run well, which I'm skeptical of, but if it is, they're potentially using their money to leverage an increase in renewable natural gas within the system, but they're also drawing frack natural gas, you know, standard natural gas directly in the building and in that way, increasing that demand at the same time. So I think it's counterintuitive and counterproductive when we know that it is more cost efficient and more sustainable to just simply build electric from the start. And a lot of developers are already just doing that um, because of the economics of it, because of the health impacts, et cetera. So um, I think we just need to we just need to be clear about this that for new buildings, let's just build it right. Um, we, we know the way to build it. We mandate that. Um, and the way that the the way that the um, ballot item was written doesn't preclude you from that. It doesn't pigeonhole you into accepting these alternative schemes. Um, it talks about fossil fuel systems versus renewables. I think you all have the ability to find that in this, and that's what you're doing. And the way it's written right now does lay out kind of what you define it, but you could write it differently and define it differently. Um, the voters weren't pigeonholing you in any direction on that. So I think definitely for new buildings, I would not... I don't think you should allow renewable natural gas. And then for existing buildings, I get that it's harder politically, particularly because of conversations that have happened with some of these large buildings 
from the administration, from the city saying, you know, you're going to be able to use this pathway of renewable natural gas. And I get that, but at the same time, you are the policymakers, you are the elected officials. Um, and, you know, the administration can't predict or control what the legislative branch does. Like you all are work, working with us, the people, and are beholden to us, and we are stakeholders, and we are impacted by this policy. And I think many of us are telling you that what we want to see is the stronger climate action. And so I think it's it's totally reasonable to um, eliminate natural gas as well from existing buildings that are that are switching out their structure and, and move them away from, from the Vermont gas system. Uh, because we're on a different timeline and trajectory than Vermont gas. We're trying to move more quickly, more aggressively. And I think as policymakers in Burlington, we have to ensure that that's the path that we're on. And the final thing I'll say, and I'll be done, is basically with Vermont gases, renewable natural gas, they're essentially paying with the hopes or the best case scenario that by them paying this premium on their gas bill, Vermont gas will increase somewhere else within the system the amount of renewable natural gas or bring a new RNG project online that will be useful. But to me, if they're going to just pay a fee for something to happen elsewhere, I'd rather them just pay the carbon fee to the city. I trust the city more than I trust BGS to actually deliver on those dollars and deliver carbon reduction benefits for those extra dollars spent. So I think if they can't comply through actually going renewable, let's have the fee go to the city, not to um, not gas. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Next, we have Connor Woods. Cool. Hey, everybody. Um, if you like reading while talking, there's like a quick little handout here. Um, I know I see my guys which only plays over when I just speak about that. Um, thanks for you know sitting through the marathon meeting last night and, and getting through it today. Hopefully you get some more vacation time because of that. <laughs> but who knows? Um, we're getting less according to Jack. <laughs> um, I mostly wanted to piggyback off of what Jack was saying and then just kind of add and speak a little bit specifically to hydrogen or green hydrogen. Um, it, it wasn't an uh, energy source I was really familiar with um, until a couple of months ago. And the more I learn about it, the more I realize that like if you know natural gas and renewable natural gas is being called into question, it really makes a lot of sense to be eliminating hydrogen um, or green hydrogen as well. Um, you know, I wasn't able to get a superstar scientist to come and testify today, but um, we did have one come and testify um, to the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee um, back when they were testifying for the Affordable Heating Act. And I can send this over to you, but it's uh, Professor Howarth, and he has like a lot of experience and expertise on researching hydrogen and the literature around that. Um, and basically, like it's more dangerous than renewable natural gas. Um, it's it's kind of called an invisible gas because you can't smell it like gas. So, you know, when you ever like leave the gas on, you smell it, and you're like, oh, I told turn it off. You can't do that with hydrogen. So if you're blending gas in, um, like we're gonna get explosions. And uh, as I testified last night, like my hometown um, had a huge explosion back in 2019. I grew up in the northern. Merrick Valley and uh, destroyed dozens of homes. And so I'm kind of sensitive to whatever we might be doing to um, put, our, put our city at risk here. So um, finally, just in terms of like the climate piece too, um, hydrogen, if you remember back to the periodic table of elements, it's the, the smallest <laughs> like element there. And um, that means that it leaks a lot more. And so uh, natural gas is a leaky substance, but if we add hydrogen, it's going to be leaking way more through the pipes and also like into our homes and houses. Um, so that's like also not good. Anyways, if you have any questions about that, um, I'd be happy to like talk to you more and connect you with people who are more eloquent than I am. Um, always really happy to do that. And yeah, look forward to continue talking. Okay.
Next up is Ashley Adams. First, I um, want to just thank you for supporting me today. That's all we have to do. Really thrilled by that. And, um, um, but I, I'm here tonight to speak about the thermal energy or carbon fee ordinance, um, which ordinarily I'd be a very strong supporter of. However, thanks to the city's misguided definition of renewable, this ordinance manages to incentivize the use of every false climate solution available, all of which are more polluting than the fossil fuels that they would be replacing. This includes advanced wood heat, renewable natural gas, biodiesel, and green hydrogen. It also incentivizes the so-called district heat, which we know we should not be investing in. We know this thanks to the June testimony of two world-class climate scientists who made clear that the McNeil plant needs to be shut down. As Dr. Muma stressed, we do not need more renewables. We need zero carbon energy and heat. The decision that businesses and developers will make when they invest in heating systems will in no small measure be impacted by whether or not they have to pay an impact fee. These are capital investments depreciated over a few decades. In other words, they'll be in place for many years, pouring pollution into both the atmosphere and the air that we breathe. This when we have only a few short years to zero out carbon emissions. Please adopt the recommended changes to this ordinance provided by Nick Persampieri so that we can move this city off harmful and polluting heating sources now. If you ever doubt the importance of the work that you're doing here, and I'm, I'm sure that you don't, there's an arresting example from today's New York Times of why we need to act quickly. And here it is. Warming could push the Atlantic past the tipping point this century. The system of ocean currents that regulates the climate for a swath of the planet could collapse sooner than expected, a new analysis found. Thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Ash. Next is Nick Persepier. I'm here. There you are. Go ahead. Thank you, and, and thank you for all the hard work you've been putting into these issues between last night and now coming back today. You're, you're keeping all the busy on these issues. We appreciate it. I just wanted to echo what Ashley had to say. Uh, let me start off by saying that um, we fo I fully support what I think is the city's main goal here, and that is to get people off of natural gas and onto electricity, and in particular heat pumps for heating homes and businesses. Um, I fully support that, but the problem I have with this ordinance is that in addition to doing that, it also incentivizes the false climate solutions that Ashley mentioned, advanced wood heating, green hydrogen, liquid biofuels, renewable gas, and McNeil district heat, none of which will help the city to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, most, if not all of them, will actually result in increased greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, a lot, some of these also have other serious harmful issues. Advanced wood heating is just an awful, an awful thing to be incentivizing within an urban area. The American Lung Association just flat out recommends that people not use wood to heat their homes. And that's because of the harmful emissions of particulate matter and other air pollutants to both the indoor air and the outdoor air. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about these issues because I presented some position papers on them. I gave you um, a write-up on advanced wood heat and why you shouldn't incentivize that, as well as handouts on renewable gas and green hydrogen. And, you know, we've talked at length about the history of heat, so I haven't given you anything further on that. 
Um, we haven't, I think, uh, addressed liquid biofuels specifically. Maybe we could get you something on that in the future. I haven't had time to work on it. Um, I did prepare uh, a markup of the proposed ordinance amendment. I ask that to adopt the changes that I'm recommending. Um, the key changes that I'm suggesting are that you go away from the concept of permitting renewable fuels which reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I think that's really confusing terminology because whether or not something is renewable says nothing about whether it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Renewable is capable of being renewed or not depleted when used. And we shouldn't confuse that concept with uh, the carbon intensity of a type of fuel. So I suggest that you change that instead of defining things as renewable fuel, which reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I suggest you refer to low carbon thermal energy systems. And then I have suggested that you strike out the systems that are not, in fact, low carbon uh, thermal energy systems. Uh, finally, let me just mention it seems apparent that in drafting the ordinance, um, some concepts from S5 have been adopted. Here, um, but S, but there hasn't been a final decision on any of these in the context of S five. What S five has done is it's listed a number of measures that are eligible for consideration as clean heat measures, and the public utility commission is going to decide whether and to what extent these various measures are entitled. To Credits, and we shouldn't be getting ahead of the public, public utility commission. And I really think the state has made serious mistakes in the things it's allowing to be considered for renewable energy credits. I think the legislative process was dominated by fossil fuel industry lobbyists. I think we can do better in Berlin. Thank you for considering. So I just want to say that Nick uh, sent these to us. Did they get into the, the record? They aren't into the record yet, but um, we can certainly add any of the material that's provided by. So, you can, so while you're running this meeting, I can forward Maddie the three emails that I think were requested from Nick. From Nick. But we also. If you would like and to include this other piece, we yeah. would have to uh, do an electronic version. Sure thing. Yeah, so you said that electronically. I'll just forward them. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks for doing this. Yes. Uh, next thing is Bill Merrick. Here's three. So there were three. Oh, yeah. Three yeah. And yeah, so then there, there was a third attachment that there were three emails just like right. Okay. So thanks for that. Yeah, so I mean, mainly I, I'm here to support Nick and Ashley's position, as we've said. And you know, one of the things that I keep running over in my head is this access, the the access of getting our information to you guys. And we always feel be I always feel behind. Like, for instance, with the McNeil plant, we've got 30 years of information. We've got 30 years of, of material being presented to us. And, you know, like anybody else, I was sitting there doing my job and running my business, and I accepted the information until I looked into it. Um, and I just want to be really clear here that we had that forum. We had two experts that had no skin in the game tell us what was up. And I just want to say, when I do my taxes, I don't hire a forester. I don't hire an engineer. 
when you account for greenhouse gas, you have to account for it by rules. If you don't hire a forester to do that, that's not their training. We don't hire utility companies to tell us how it goes down. We hire the people that study greenhouse gas. And I just really want to support Dr. Rooney Vargas, and Dr. Muma's presentation. And if you forget what they said, or if you feel like there was any argument about what they said, go back to it and listen to it again, because they're telling the truth. This stuff doesn't work. A lot of these renewables are, are upside down and backwards from what we think they are. And I can show you um, anytime you guys have a question about greenhouse gas accounting, I'm not an expert on all of it. I haven't studied the uh, biofuels, but I have studied biomass. It is not green. That's all I'm going to say. And I'd be glad to help you out with that accounting anytime. Any questions? Because we're getting a lot of information. And I don't think Darren's giving us bad information intentionally. But he's not a greenhouse, greenhouse gas accountant. He's a utility operator. You know, and it, it just doesn't work that way. You need to go to your account to get your taxes done. Okay, so that's where I'm at tonight. Um, Got a Taco Tuesday to go to. We go to that. What do you do? And uh, you went for me when you went. You want me to? You know, I could put it uh, yeah. on the soil and bring it back. We live in the same neighborhood. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Phil. How are um, I think Pike was next before Catherine signed up. So I'm going to recognize Pike online next. You can enable his mic. Good evening. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there in person tonight. Um, Ida, I'm also um, asking you to at least table this, or on if, or even more, reduce, remove any instance in this um, ordinance that includes combustion, because anything that you're burning is going to create greenhouse gas emissions. Um, earlier this evening, I sent the three counselors um, a notice of intent to sue signed by the Attorney General of Vermont and uh, nine other states attorneys general um, that pretty much says that the certification process for uh, advanced wood heating systems is junk. Um, even if they were if even even if the certification systems were not junk, there's nothing in the advanced wood heat system that actually removes carbon dioxide. They emit just as much ca carbon dioxide as a campfire or any other system that burns, such as McNeil, which is about a pound of carbon dioxide per, for wood. So it, it, uh, advanced wood heating should, should not be there. And if it is in there, it should not be in there until this case is resolved and there's a, a real certification process. Um, Renewable natural gas needs to stay at the landfill or stay at the at the farm. Uh, they're not renewable natural gas. The methane that would go into the renewable natural gas. As soon as you transport it, you're subjecting the stuff to leaking and all and transportation and all kinds of things, and it, it too becomes uh, worse than the natural gas that you're replacing. Um, I'd like to point out line six, uh, excuse me, line 76 specifically, um, where uh, it calls out liquid or gaseous uh, renewables, but it, it neglects to include solids. So I'd like you to make, uh, um, suggest an amendment, either remove the words liquid and gaseous or add the word solid so that solid fuels such as wood are also included into this system. And finally, I'd like the um, two to reconsider and ask um, whoever is doing the net zero roadmap to start considering and start accounting for all carbon dioxide um, and stop um, pretending that all we need to do is get rid of fossil fuels because we need to get rid of all combustion systems. Thank you for, my, uh, for listening. Thank you, Pike. Um, next is Catherine Block. 
Nice to see you again. Thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm also speaking on the thermal energy system ordinance. And I basically think it's a really good idea. I agree that beyond burning fossil fuels that are used for heating will reduce the amount of fossil fuels we use. And that's a good thing. I also applaud the emphasis on electrification, heat pumps, utilization. The problem I see, which is what many others have said, is that a fee on fossil fuels will incentivize the other solutions that still are in greenhouse gas gases. And here I'm speaking of green hydrogen and best would heat RNG and liquid biofuels. Last night at the city council meeting, someone near the end speaking on how they're burning biofuels and biomass in Europe um, for much of their energy use. And I don't know if that was meant to convince us that biofuels are better than fossil fuels, but it immediately took my mind to think of my son who began speed skating age three. And uh, I remember his first race, this long legged skinny little guy in a baggy speed skating suit and he loved it. At age eight, he and a group of friends decided they were going to be on the Swedish Olympic team. And they spent their whole childhood training. Now in Sweden, they burn trash for energy. Sounds like a renewable resource. They just collect it, drive it to the burner, dump it. And you can imagine it does produce some strange smells sometimes when you're driving around it in Gothenburg. I don't know where the burners were, but we smelled it. Um, then we learned that the energy to keep this 400 meter speed skating rink frozen, they got from burning trash. So my son developed asthma, which is very common in Swedish children, but he was determined to keep skating. And so we got the inhalers and the medications and kept him going. And he got to be pretty good. And so after high school, they moved to Berlin and trained with the Swedish speed skating team. It was always easy to spot him because he was the skater wearing a big green, um, what do they call it, a big fleece gator over his nose and mouth to form the air because that would also set up an asthma attack. Um, uh, he did spend a year in Berlin, but it ended up that it was asthma made it impossible for him to train often enough to get any better. So he was too slow and they sent him home. And he's now working in California with outdoor education, which personally I think is much more useful than trying to be the fastest in the world going around a 400 meter ring. But there are many smoky days in California as there are here. And so he's often inside near the air pure fire. Um, I'm telling you the story because it may seem gross to burn trash and I admit the trash produces a lot more pollution than hydrogen and biofuels, but burning non-fossil fuels also produces greenhouse gases, even in Europe. And that's what we've been saying. So this ordinance would be a great step in reducing greenhouse gases in Burlington if it was changed by adding green hydrogen, advanced wood heat, renewable natural gas and biofuels to the same class as fossil fuels. So they also be charged a fee and they would be difficult for them to continue emitting greenhouse gases. We do need laws to reduce, reduce burning of everything to make eventually make it financially impossible or impossible to, to emit greenhouse gases. Thank you very much for hearing me. Okay. Um, we have two more speakers. Um, Thank you. Um, I think uh, we'll go with Steve Bitcoin next. Sweden. Don't have Steve Shanks. I came back because I burned your ash there. Just uh, heard some of the other speakers. I know I missed some of it, but I think this, this committee still needs to get at the question of what does it mean when you say wood is renewable? And BD just dances around it. They can bring in the foresters. The question was that answer is supposing 
and it needs to be answered. Winds are noble means everyone's looking at clear in the eye. We know that winds are noble, say every day, solar every day, hydro maybe on an annual basis at best, but you, you don't have that answer. And I think you need it. It's pretty simple. If a tree is cut down today, some of it is burned in the field. When does that tree get back to where it was to say it's been removed? And it's not a hard thing to show. And I think when you see it, you'll realize that renewable doesn't really even come into the equation when we're talking about, say, 2030 or 2050 as the drop dead dates for dealing with climate change in the city. So it's an easy question to get. You should demand it and not have it obscured with some kind of graph or theory, but there's a number. Forresters will tell you how long it takes a tree to grow back in Vermont. And if you think that that period of time represents anything that is going to be helpful in the battle against climate change in the city, go with it. But I think you're going to find that it's totally irrelevant in the battle against climate change because trees don't grow at a pace that's going to make any significant difference in the next 20 years, 10 or 20 years when we're fighting climate change. And they may be renewable on some scale, but not the scale that you should be, I think you are concerned about. So I just ask you to demand of them to show you when they, from data, when a tree is truly renewed. And use the same kind of judgment as you say, when is wind renewed, when is solar renewed? It's 100% replaced every day. Well, what if a tree? It's probably on a scale of 100 to 200 years. And it's not helping at all in our fight against climate change. And by the way, as you know, trees grow at an exponential rate. So in the first 50 years, let's say it's 100 years to be fully grown. In the first 50 years, it doesn't grow at 50%. It grows about 30% or so. And in 20 years, it grows to maybe 10%. So ask the questions and then they make uh, informed decision on this because they're really trying to but just think of the word renewable can mean different things. Coal is renewable on a million years schedule too. So I think it's an easy question to get the answer to, and I think it will make a big difference in how we look at uh, the use of wood in the city. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And our last speaker looks like is Peter Duvall online. Actually, Dan Castrogano is here. I want to wrap this section up soon. People, um, if Peter and Dan can make their comments in the next five minutes or so. You can allow them both to go. So, Peter, keep that in mind, please. Go ahead. Well, thank you for the opportunity to comment. And uh, I am Peter Duval. I live in Underhill, a uh, town from which McNeil Generating Station receives many tons of wood chips. And when McNeil foresters and loggers come to town, they bring their skidders and whole tree chippers and tractor trailers and drive them into the forest for a noisy, diesel burning party all day long. When that diesel burning party's over and the atmospheric river inevitably appears, raindrops, instead of falling on tree leaves and deep forest duff, fall on brambles and shrubbery and they unite in rivulets and streams and quickly join Stevensville Brook and Browns River, which pass through Underhill Center and by the old Red Mill on the way to the Lamoille River and Lake Champlain where they bring their phosphorus and sediment. So if you're disappointed in the beach closures during the summer, you can, you can thank the city and BED for, its, for McNeil's contribution to uh, the lake's troubles. And I tell you that story to remind you that McNeil's effects are, as BED is presented, on the landscape. And it's proudly proclaimed that the effects are on the landscape and not at the smokestack. But this is a, a utility decision-making and management problem, not a debate about biogenic emissions as, uh, as the advocates uh, you know, relatively new to this are describing BED, the McNeil Joint Owners, the city, Green Mountain Power, Department of Public Service, Public Utility Commission, have all been well aware of the problem of biogenic emissions. 
Muma has been around forever. I remember reading his papers in 1992 when I participated in the Public Service Board's Docket 5611, party to which all of the utilities were. There's no excuse for not knowing that biogenic emissions are exactly the same as fossil fuel emissions. Indeed, in draft rule that was presented at the end of the investigation and negotiation included specific exclusion of biomass facilities from qualifying renewables. Because utility decision-making is unique, completely different from other types of business operations, it is the utility's responsibility to act in public interest and prepare the decision before coming, getting even close to talking to the Burlington Electric Commission, which has fallen down in its responsibility to expect good, prudent, diligent work from the utility. You should not be receiving information from the advocates. It should be coming from the utility, a complete uh, profile of the, of the situation with fair solicitations from all resources, careful study of all issues and risks. It is a huge risk to make an assumption about emissions as BED has done and the city. So what I would like to suggest to you is you start asking the questions that should have been asked much, much earlier, long before BED and the city committed ratepayer and taxpayer funds to the STEAM project and expanding and continuing McNeil, which has always been a losing business operation. Thanks, Peter. What, let me just give you a couple of questions, okay? Yeah. Why, you... why, why is McNeil different than the Burgess Biomass Plant in Berlin, which is $150 million Yeah. Hey, Peter, could you, I mean, you market? Wanna... Peter, excuse Why? me, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt you. If you could submit the questions in writing, um, we'll make sure that we see them. You could ask that question of Mr. Springer right no, I now. Just need to, I need to wrap up public forum yep. so that we can move on to the you're other gonna, portion. You're going to have meeting. a presentation from him pretty soon. And you could ask him some tough questions right now. Okay, thank you. Just, you can send those along to us. I think we've, we've heard some of the questions to post before in other forums as well. So we're aware of, uh, of many of your concerns. Um, okay. Thank you for doing your duty as public uh, officials representing the public interest and ensuring that Mr. Springer and Thanks, the Electric Department do their duty. Thank you. Um, and our final speaker, and we're starting to run over now, is uh, Dan Castorgana. So Dan, if you could uh, keep it someone brief so we can get on to the rest of our meeting tonight. Thanks. Listen to the science, listen to the people, and don't listen to Darren Springer and the Burlington Greenwashing Department. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, and with that, I'm gonna close public forum and move on to our next agenda item, which is a uh, discussion of city fleet. And uh, please go meet us in that. Yep, thanks for having us. Joining me tonight is Ashley Parker. Um, we're representing the fleet committee. As you may remember, when we came to Board of Finance and City Council for FY24 fleet purchases um, that was approved, we reached out to the committee to schedule some meetings to uh, discuss how the city can move forward in creating a sustainable uh, fleet funding strategy. 
Um, uh, as you may have read in the memo, you know, I have some quick bullets. Uh, I'll keep it quick <laughs> for you all. I know we have a busy agenda. Um, you know, the city owns over 400 fleet units at citywide. The general fund itself has 276 units, which is about 68% of the total fleet. Um, it's about two to three million dollars annually um, to create the sustainable fleet replacement strategy uh, moving forward. And as you know, there's currently no funding available to purchase general fund vehicles uh, going forward. In addition to the annual need, we still have um, leases to cover in FY 25 and 26 uh, of about a million dollars uh, each fiscal year. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ashley. Um, jump right in if, if you want to add anything as well. Um, you know, and if, um. <laughs> okay. And, and, you know, and if a, a replacement funding strategy isn't um, devised, you know, through these meetings, um, you know, it could impact some of the services that we provide to residents. Um, you know, when I say general fund fleet, that's fire trucks, that's police vehicles, um, plow trucks, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, equipment that supports our infrastructure. Um, so just you know, keep that in mind. Um, and we did outline some questions uh, for the committee in the, the memo. I don't know if you had a chance to review them. Um, you know, asking, you know, for direction and guidance and how we should proceed with this. Uh, we did have a study done back in 2018 prior to when I took over this position, but I am familiar with the study moving forward. Uh, we actually created our fleet purchasing policy from that study, but there were recommendations in that study on, um, you know, possibilities of how we can take some portions of that study and contribute it to the annual fleet funding. It was more in efficiencies and right-sizing the fleet um, and, and recommendations like that. And, you know, moving forward at, um, you know, upcoming meetings, we, we can provide you with that study if you would like to review it and a uh, list of recommendations that Ashley and uh, the fleet committee has come up with. Some are stated in the memo. Um, but yeah, we really like to, to get your input on um, some of these questions that we have outlined on page three. Yeah, Defer. I guess if, the, if it's okay, Lee, I'll just add. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just to let you also know of some of the other work that we've been asked to do, um, I'm sure you'll remember during the budget uh, process this year that the mayor has shown a desire to engage with a consultant to try to assist us with, the, with this issue or an issue. And so we have been working through these recommendations that were identified in these two studies to try to determine if there are opportunities to, um, you know, get more information or even dive further into a recommendation, maybe implement something that was recommended in the study using the help of a consultant. And so we're working to put together some recommendations um, as well for an RFP that might go out to a consultant like this. And so that's something also to consider um, as you look through the bullets that we've highlighted for you in the memo tonight. Um, we, the, the bullets that you'll see for both revenue and expense options are things that we, you know, the fleet committee, the finance work group um, felt might actually be worth considering in terms of moving forward and trying to come up with some long-term financial revenue strategies um, that will help us get to where we wanna be. So I think that's just some additional background when you're looking at these. And if you have ideas to, you know, something that's not on here or something that you think is, is not worth our time and energy, I, those are the kinds of things I think we'd really like to hear from you guys um, so that we can shape um, a recommendation for, for a consultant and future RFP. So I think that's all I have for now. No, I, I actually, you know, pretty much hit the nail on the head and kind of filled in the, okay. the gaps in the memo. Well, well, thank you. Are there um, questions about the memo? I mean, I believe that you were asking for guidance. Correct. So it's, um, 
and uh, and I know this is the initial meeting, you know, and, yeah. and we're planning yeah. more meetings, and this is a lot of information to to get. Yes, and uh, I have to admit that I was focused on a few other things this morning after a long meeting last night. That being said, um, in looking quickly and if other people fill space, I'll get through other bullets and be able to maybe give some more uh, feedback. Um, I, I think that your first bullet on revenue options is worthy of consideration, which for everybody else who's out there who has, doesn't have this is build elite funding into the general fund budget, either by requiring budget departments to budget for their own replacements or carving out a general fund wide fleet budget by reducing other expenses. I think that's always something to, to you know, mm -hmm. that needs to be considered on this. I am not in favor personally of returning to a strategy of cash purchases uh, that seems to be off. These are capital expenses and they should be treated as such and not as general operating expenses. Um, the bonding bullet is um, it's the right one, but it's problematic with a uh, with where we're at in bonding. And so I don't know how to, to deal with it, you know, in, a, in, 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 the, in the, the status quo that we have for, for raising mm -hmm. um, the The fourth budget, uh, fourth bullet on revenues, which I'm not sure is a revenue, but what the heck, annually assess the existing, existing fleet to determine whether there are any vehicles or equipment that can be sold. I guess that is a uh, is a revenue thing. Yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, but okay, so that's about as far as I, I quickly got on that. If you mm -hmm. let me just sort of march down, I think this is what you were yes. looking for in terms of um, our feedback. And, you know, sort of the bigger concepts, I think, flow from much of these getting thrown in, yeah. uh, you know, and then they, these spark other ideas. More discussion. Yeah. So anyway, if I, if I can kick a can sure. to you, then I'll go, I'll look and maybe look at the expense side a little bit. Uh, well, sure. Um, you know, my understanding, at least from a board of finance meeting that I attended that we were moving forward with the consultant. Is are we likely to, or is there an inclination to? And you're just asking us to uh, sort of bless it because I think it would be useful to have um, some some outside expertise to help us understand, you know, the options. Um, maybe someone who's worked with other entities or municipalities that have. Got in similar similar places. But should it be another wholesale fleet? Um, yeah, I guess just for clarification. Yeah, I was just gonna say for clarification, um, there is gonna be a consultant. I think when I was approached by the CAO to start looking at it coming up with an RFP, they she had not been aware, and the mayor I think forgot that we had these existing studies. And so they were kind of pairing with what his initial take was on what he wanted to move with. So what we're trying to do is say, okay, we did these existing studies. We have these recommendations. Are there, are there gaps that we need to further dive into? Are there opportunities to maybe throw in, um, you know, some of these more revenue focused um, ideas to help us have something that we could implement sooner rather than later? Because a lot of a lot of the times we do a study, they'll give you a bunch of recommendations, but it takes time to implement those. And because of where we are with the revenues, and it's truly something that we need to figure out sooner rather than later. It seems like if we had somebody we could bring on board to provide us some guidance to, and, and maybe help us actually have something to implement within the year <laughs> would be ideal. Um, you know, I think that would be something that I would love to like incorporate into a recommendation where we could have an RFP with maybe a scope of work to say, to show the mayor's office and see if that is something that they would also be interested in. That way we're not redoing the same kind of study with the same, you know, same focus. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll say that I have not read the studies or seen the studies. So I guess I would 
I would like to start there personally, just to see what's what's been done, um, and that might inform um, some some recommendation from me, anyways. I don't know. I would agree with what Mark just said. So let's, I mean, we start. Yes. Yeah, so all of the uh, expense options seem worthy of continued um, discussion and review. I don't. I didn't see any of them that make no sense at, at all. Um, not, and virtually not even the cash. It, it makes some sense. I don't think we should go that way. So I don't mean to be insulting. I say it like that. Um, the. Uh, I've been known to say things like that. Um, in terms of the uh, the revenue picking up from where um, I was at, which I think was the, the annual assessment, um, mm -hmm. uh, the rest of them seem reasonable. I I, I think that the uh, the new carbon fee uh, bullet. Uh, which I think makes a lot of sense in terms of using the sources of funds, uh, and we're talking about this now, is nothing that's going to be in any um, near term. And I think that there's, there are a lot of, there are going to be a lot of demands for that just in the thermal sector, so not in the transportation sector. So I don't know that I would have that as being a uh, a high um, priority in terms of the timing for studies and and banking on things and you know both the the, the franchise fee um, and the, all of the stuff related to the enterprise departments um, is sort of interesting. It's not quite clear um, in terms of franchise fees what exactly it is you're talking about. We charge them, they get paid into the city, they're an alternative to the property tax. So why you couldn't be using them? I mean, I think that all these things need to be rationalized within the concept of a capital program for the city's fleet, mm -hmm. a fleet which is absolutely needed to function as a municipality that works. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, and, and you know, uh, there's been a lot of rational, what I, what I consider to be like economic rationalization over a long time. And, I mean, there's been a lot of progress. I know that because I worked on leases like 15 years ago mm -hmm. for us. So it's, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, we're doing stuff. And, you know, some of this is, you know, if, if utilizing credit cards to pay the vendors and put the rebuild paid money for the fleet, it, I mean, if the, those are sort of like these small ideas that, you know, like they come and go as, yeah. as the rebates change and, and what have you. So I, I don't know that you need us to be trying to be micromanaging that, that level of you know like the daily whatever it is uh, you know moving money there there's it's not triage what are, what are people that um arbitrage that's it the people that are like making a gazillion dollars off of one page being you know different in their trades you know like you know you need somebody I and mean, i think that's what munir does that uh, you know he, he, he's Pretty, I think it is Munir that really understands the uh, the system and, and the purchases and what have you. Uh, James Gibbons. Okay, James. Sorry, but you know, so there are people that are there that can do that, or that we you know could look to, to bring mm -hmm. on. So that is my um, so I, my 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 feedback on that. So in terms of actions, I mean, there's there's no action. provide us with. Yep. The studies, what's the time, the, the sort of general timeline on this? I know that um, if we're going to bring a consultant in, if we're going to make decisions based on previous studies mm -hmm. and new recommendations, all that needs to sort of be 
done in time for the for next year's budgeting cycle, which will begin when in like October or so. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so is that, is that realistic, even between now and now? yeah, I, I think we should schedule, you know, a, a, another meeting or two between now and then. Yeah. Um, we'll get you get on our the information. Yeah. Um, have you look it over and take you know your input from this meeting back to the entire fleet committee um as a group and we have a meeting in august coming out of it, august 17th so bring that information back and some of your feedback and if you come up with um, more questions or any other feedback or guidance you can always email it to myself or ashley or chapin okay um or all three of us you just time. mail whatever information you have or links to yep to yep us. Okay. We'll, we'll send it electronically Excellent. both three uh study the only last thing is whether um there's any connection that can or should or could be made with a uh, regional uh, planning commission and also with other municipalities i mean the whole regional dispatch is not really working, and it may be that this cannot operate. But the the if I mean every department of public works needs dump trucks, needs you know you, you have all these similar needs. Yeah. Um, uh, and there so and so perhaps um, there is uh, some both efficiencies. And collaboration that can occur um, that the commission could be helping in terms of studying, but also that an intermunicipal agreement might um, be worthy of consideration. And that might be a, just a pipe dream, but you know, Champlain Water District South. Mm -hmm. there, you know, I don't know. And I mean, it may be that. Part of it is um, if, if, if we have a vigorous program here, that might be a source of revenue. I, I don't know, maybe, but you know what I'm getting at? We're going mm -hmm. to that. So I think mean, we tend to look pretty myopically. There's not a, it's not necessary, I mean, in and of itself. Yeah, we can perhaps it comes to me. Okay. Do you have any other questions, Ashley? No, I think I think we're just well excited, really, to have you guys. You know, if there are any other ideas out there that you know we could throw in this mix, I think the group as a whole has acknowledged that this is going to take you know multiple multiple sources of funding. I think to make it sustainable, and it's going to take some time to build up any kind of reserve that ends up being the trajectory that we go in, but. Um, every little bit, any idea is not bad. Um, and I just appreciate your time and thought um, on this topic. So, yeah. Can, uh, can, uh, can counselors attend the fleet committee meeting? Or is... oh, we, we can invite you. It if... would oh, be interesting. If I, I, we'll see if, I mean, I'd be interested in attending. Yeah, it's, um, so yeah, it's pretty much department so heads, uh, all within the general fund, okay. fire, parks, and rec, they're represented. Yeah. Okay. Next on our uh, thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you I appreciate your time. Your thank pleasure. you very much. Next is uh, the ordinance on the property. Um, we have there are many manager Springer here from the community to take this on. Thank you. Um, I feel compelled, and forgive me, but I feel compelled to say that on behalf of the hardworking employees at BD. Um, I can't agree with terms like greenwashing for the work that we do. And I feel like I, I need to say this to respond to some of the comments that were made. Um, we may have disagreements within the community on policy. I respect that. Well, we have reports on our website that indicate from third parties uh, that there are emissions benefits from McNeil. We have folks who come to the forum who said differently. I respect that. Um, we're a municipal public power utility. We are not a fossil fuel company. We're not ExxonMobil. Uh, we work for the people of Burlington. And I just feel compelled to say that uh, there's nothing that we do that fits with those terms. And so on behalf of the organization, the employees, the hardworking employees, I feel compelled to say that. That said, I'm really here to, to answer questions uh, if you have them on the uh, draft uh, ordinance that I know was introduced uh, yesterday evening. 
I'm happy to discuss some of the process that went into it. I know we presented uh, at the two previously on this. Um, happy to talk about some of the policy distinctions uh, within the proposal. Uh, the one thing I would say is uh, there has been a serious policy development at the state level uh, with uh, the clean heat standard uh, becoming law. I know over the governor's signature, going through a public utility uh, commission process and uh, subject to further confirmation by the state legislature, I think to the extent it's feasible, it's smart policy for the city to work within some of the constructs that will be happening at the state level. Uh, the state's created a process by which uh, fuels can be looked at uh, for carbon intensity, which is, is included in the draft proposal as well, uh, that we can um, you know, use recognized national models for evaluating life cycle emissions of various fuels, which is the appropriate way to evaluate any fuel, whether it's solar, wind, nuclear, fossil fuel, biomass, biofuels, life cycle basis, um, and uh, provides a process for the Department of Permitting and Inspections to ask for uh, analyses prior to qualifying or disqualifying fuels, provides a process for the city to be nimble in responding to developments at the state level. Uh, obviously, we act uh, hopefully in leadership here uh, on this policy, but we act within the state construct as well. And I think having some alignment with the state uh, would be good practice. Um, but really uh, happy to speak to any pieces of this that are helpful or to uh, answer questions that you might have. I think Bill Ward was intending to be online as well. Uh, I'm not sure if he is uh, yet, but I know he was planning to join for the conversation and Jennifer Green, uh, sustainability director is here as well. Um, we'll open up the questions. Sure. Uh, I think this is not so much of a question, but sort of a, a framework. We've got, this is an ordinance in our building code. Okay, so it's in our building code and it's authorized by a charter section that says that we can, I got it right here, that we can regulate thermal energy systems in residential and commercial buildings. Okay, so that's the framework, we'll leave the, the money out of it. So that's what we're doing with this ordinance. It's in chapter, well, it's in section 48 and subsection 66 of that. You can get there in lots of different ways, but uh, um, but that's the, uh, the charter section. So then we go to this ordinance and what and, and I want to thank you right I, I mean for really good time that you've spent with me mm -hmm. to work through this I, I I think that you have been clear and straightforward and helpful and I totally appreciate that and I am very happy that you are a public servant and that this is a municipal utility so I I I, I want to say that and I believe that I am on the same team even if I and we have in the past and we won't always agree sure it's just of course yeah, that's the way I am as much as anybody else um so in this ordinance we are we're doing a couple of things we're doing two things really one is that we are saying what can go in and then we're saying if that we're gonna we're gonna charge a fee for certain things and that fee is now to flip to the second piece is the one it is a fee that is authorized by the voters and the charter section that i read says that we can assess carbon impact or alternative compliance payments for the purpose of reducing greenhouse gas emissions throughout the city, but we cannot do it, just paraphrase the next question, unless the people vote by a majority. Okay. And the people did vote by a majority um, to put uh, a fee of up to $150 per ton, adjusted annually at the rate of, of regional inflation, um for new construction buildings that install and here's the the thing which i'm sort of like in a way stuck on 
in relationship to this bigger question that people have raised. Install fossil fuel thermal energy systems instead of using renewable energy systems or renewable fluid fuels. So the key on the fee in my, um, my reading of this, and unfortunately for everybody who I deal with now, I deal with this as a, as a current relatively non-practicing attorney, is that um, it is, um, the fees are gonna be on fossil fuel thermal energy systems, right? Now it says instead of using renewables, but if you had a fossil fuel energy system, that would be subject to the fee, correct? Right. And what that means is that a non fossil fuel energy system is not subject to the fee. That's not been authorized. So here is my rub with how we're sort of looking at this, right? Is that we're looking at this as you're putting these systems in, these thermal energy systems, in, and either you're paying a fee or you're not. But I'm not, and, and for something like renewable gas, right? And I was, you know, I've been pretty clear that I'm not, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. Um, that um, the question of whether it fits in the fossil fuel a definition um, or not is, I think, an open one, and I think is something that we can do differently within the authority that we've been given by the voters for the fee on that particular one. But I am confused at this point in time by how to deal with polluting, what I'll say, or, you know, for, for but yeah, polluting or emitting um, sources that are not fossil fuel, but are not something that would be um, be good for us to, to to promote, and whether we are promoting them is is a live question. The advanced wood heat wood heating system is an example of that, and what's interesting is that we don't avoid this conflict here because if an advanced wood heating system is not a fuel fossil now we've got in here that it's exempt from the fee if it meets these standards and if it doesn't meet these standards that means that it is subject to the fee but i'm not sure that we've got actually the, the authority in that realm which leads me parenthetically to say we should go back to the voters um in march and that that should be another job for this committee to do to, to, to clean this up but if there is a way that we can regulate things. And I'm not saying that I've been convinced about it by the, the green hydrogen, but for argument's sake, green hydrogen in a way that is, it takes it out of the fee part, but still regulates it as part of a heating, a building heating system. That seems to be something that we should do in the interim. And I have not worked through it. I'm, I was trying to grapple with the, this, this mind thing. It's sort of like playing three-dimensional chess in my mind. Um, but pulling the things out besides the uh, the renewable gas, which I think we should have a, a full conversation within this framework, um, is something that I think we ought to consider. 
uh, and, and I'm not sure what we do with them if we say, uh, you know, we could, you could just say that they're not allowed, I think. We're just not going to permit them, right? Uh, and kick that can down the road, especially if the likelihood that there would be um, buildings that are going to, um, to, to install a green hydrogen sourced um, system is not very high, then I don't know that taking it down the road until we can figure out some stuff would be um, uh, would be a bad thing. Okay, so I just sort of laid open my conundrum. I've gone a long time, and I'm sorry for 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 that. But um, that's my thinking, and uh, just close it up. I think that I need to be more convinced that the renewable gas provision that we've got in here means that that gas that's being produced at a um, at a, at a farm, uh, say in Addison, is going to go to a building that we're going to put in the new South End Innovation District, right? That's being that's going to be built um, because uh, my good friend Jack Hansen has, uh, I think, uh, convinced me that the likelihood of there being very much of the, the total volume of gas that would come into a pipe, into a building right here that we're just building um, from the, the farm, the renewable farm in Addison is really, really small. So 95% of it, 50% of it, or even 40 or 30% of it is coming from regular natural gas does not seem to be the direction that we should go. And I don't think that it should be subject to the uh, to the exemption if there's basically any non-renewable non gas in that mix. So and I don't know how this, I, I understand what we're trying to do with this language, but I don't know that it actually does that per se. So anyway. No, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's good. I mean, you opened up some questions that I had as well. But, um, did, did you have? A... I need to unpack and find out what you said. Okay, I need to unpack I mean, that's the problem with this, is this is pretty dense. I had, I had questions while we're unpacking and and the uh, uh, repack. Repack. Um, I'm quite at the uh, subsection C on um, lines 72 to 76, where um, we talk about renewable fuels. Um, the uh, Department of Permitting Inspection may disqualify any renewable fuel that reduces um, greenhouse gas uh, emissions listed above from being eligible to satisfy the requirements of, of the section if the fuel is subsequently deemed. By the Vermont Public Utility Commission, not to satisfy the carbon intensity requirements of the uh, AD standard. Can you talk a little bit about um, whether whether or not that's like does the would the if we wanted to disqualify something, would we take it to the Vermont Public Utility Commission, or we, or are we just trying to is this speaking more to trying to stay aligned with with uh, with the state standards on? Yeah, I, I can explain this. And, and there's a reason that it speaks, and this language is very much in line with what was the clean heat standard. There's a reason it speaks to liquid or gaseous renewable fuels, because those are fuels that are dropping into what would otherwise be a fossil fuel system that may be renewable fuels. So think about biodiesel going into an oil heating system or renewable gas going into a natural gas-based system. If it's wood energy, uh, whether it's district heat or whether it's advanced wood energy, it's wood energy and it's, it's essentially delivered in a way physically uh, to the site. You know, if you're getting, if you have a pellet boiler for some reason, you're going to get your pellets delivered on site. If you're connected to district heat and you're part of the renewable credit system with district heat, you're getting uh, the delivery of the fuel and credits uh, from the fuel. With this particular piece, it's intended to address, I think, some of the concerns that, that we we're just discussing which is how do I know if a building that installed a conventional natural gas 
boiler, let's say, and says they're going to use renewable fuel is getting renewable fuel. And we don't track the molecule of fuel in the system. You can't do that. Uh, same way I can't track an electron on the grid. But we have projects like Community Solar all across Vermont that everybody uh, is generally supportive of. And the way we account for those is through renewable credits, where we say that solar project is putting out X number of megawatt hours of energy. Each megawatt hour of energy gets a renewable credit. Somebody gets to own that credit and claim that energy. And if I'm a home uh, in Burlington and I don't have solar on my roof, but I'm connected to, uh, let's say, a solar system that's in a field, um, and I'm buying into that system and I'm getting renewable credits on my bill, then I'm able to say I have solar energy from that solar project. Similar concept with these uh, fuels. Somebody says I'm purchasing renewable gas through a PUC approved tariff, then Vermont Gas has to ensure that they are getting the quantity of gas that's being purchased from that uh, customer into their system. Now, the molecule we cannot track. But that quantity of renewable fuels being brought online essentially in their name with their being able to make a legal claim to it. And that's, I think, what this language is intended to do. It's also intended to say, if we figure out, either we or the PUC, um, uh, but it could be that the department asks for its own analysis separate from the PUC, that one of these fuels is not, in fact, reducing greenhouse gas emissions relative to the fossil fuel alternative, you could disqualify it. And then you would say, no, this fuel is not uh, qualified. You have a fossil fuel system, and therefore you would be subject to the fee. Would, that would you have to take it? I mean, so I'm, I'm trying to understand if that signal would come from us to the PUC. And, no. Or, they, or would we wait for the PUC, some action on the part of the PUC? I think it's intended to try to future-proof the policy a little bit and provide for some flexibility in the future. We are operating under the assumption currently that these renewable fuels that were qualified in the clean heat standard are going to be uh, able to meet this, this barrier. Uh, if they cannot, if they are demonstrated not to, either because the PUC determines it in their process or the Department of Permitting and Inspections asks for analysis for a particular you know, applicant and they can't produce credible analysis that says the fuel they're purchasing, whether it's hydrogen or renewable gas, whatever it is, is reducing emissions using the model that's spelled out in the clean heat standard degree or a similar model of rigor, then the department can say, I'm sorry, this does not count. We're not going to include it. And therefore, if you have a fossil fuel system and you're buying that fuel, we're saying it doesn't count and you're still subject to the fee. I know, that, you know there's some complexity to that, but that's the intent. I like the alignment with the state. I don't like us sort of forging on the um, definitions. Um, I think it, it can be, you know, problematic, um, especially when we're talking about when I talk often about the plight of people and capital from the city, we don't we want to be as competitive regionally as other communities are for uh, Vermonters to live. So I like when we can align with state uh, regulation and policy so that we can, you know, not put ourselves at a disadvantage. So and just be clear, we're the electric utility. We love electrification. We promote and incentivize electrification. My expectation is in. 90 plus percent of the cases where this applies in new construction, we're going to see electrification as the preferred option in our experience. Um, it's really important to have other options um, in order to ensure that not just new construction, but existing buildings that have existing distribution systems and maybe more limited in the ability to electrify their heating or thermal loads have a way to comply with this because, it, it, you know, as Councilor Bergman said, it's a carbon fee alternative compliance. It's not intended to be a tax. It's not intended to be the first option. It's intended to be an option that you reach if you can't comply. And so by having several different ways for a building to comply, we hopefully are more cost effective. We are hopefully more uh, able to help get more renewable uh, energy that's reducing greenhouse gas emissions into the system, as opposed to just saying to somebody, if you can't electrify, you pay the fee, which as a city owning its own municipal electric utility might be seen as well as, as somewhat self-dealing. And we're conscious of that perception as well. Well, my other comment, and I, don't, I have one other one. So I'm still sort of grappling with how we how we keep or exclude certain renewable fuels in or in or out of the policy. So I'll just state that I'm, you know, I think there may be, you know, there seems to be a mechanism here that's built in. We just talked about, but I'm still um, not entirely clear how we that would be um, reached. How we would do that. Like I think you said, if, a, if someone wanted to use a particular renewable fuel, right, 
And really, we're talking about an instance where you're using fossil fuel technology, not a renewable technology, not a heat pump, not a geothermal heat pump, um, not district energy or a wood boiler. These are all you know, non-fossil fuel uh, systems. If you're using a fossil fuel system, uh, the only way you don't get charged the fee is if you're using a qualified renewable fuel. Right, and that, that is to which qualified renewable fuels. Right, and we have a list here, but but right. any of these could be liquid or gaseous drop-in fuels subject to additional uh, carbon modeling and intensity analysis, right. either by us at the Department of Permitting as the enforcer of the uh, both ordinance, or uh, potentially if we take notice of the fact that the PUC has taken on a similar analysis right. and reached a different conclusion, um, in either of those cases, we could say, I'm sorry, you know, we use the example of green hydrogen. I'm sorry, we've determined that in your case where you're saying you're going to have green hydrogen, we don't believe it re actually reduces greenhouse gas emissions relative to the fossil fuels. You haven't been able to produce uh, modeling at the rigor level required. So therefore, if you're using a fossil fuel system, that green hydrogen isn't going to count. You're going to have to pay a fee. So I like that mechanism. I like the fact that it future proofs us and allows us some flexibility. My the only my only other comment um, was around, and I, you and I have had discussions around using this this essentially this ordinance is to help us um, tackle the challenges in the thermal sector. And my preference has been if there is a fee, and our hope is that we don't charge the fee, right? Because it means that people are using the technologies that we want them to use. Um, but if we charge a fee, that fee should be used to offset. Um, offset other emissions in the thermal sector. And that would be my preference. That's just the way my mind works. This is a fee we're charging to, you know, thermal. We, we know we have these, these really uh, difficult challenges there. So, but I also understand our challenges with, with fleet funding. And so I hope this is a really small um, pool of money we're talking about, but we know we have some larger commercial buildings that may not have any option but to pay. It, it, I, I expect from a revenue standpoint for the city, this will be an unpredictable and lumpy revenue source. And that it could be in a given year, depending on what's being developed or what permits are being pulled, you could see six figures uh, of revenue come in. There could be other years where you see very little. Um, and it'll really just depend on the state of technology uh, what types of buildings are being permitted, uh, what types of, of options they have. Uh, so I think it'll, it won't be something that will be easy to uh, bank on in a predictable way, um, but certainly we're, we're very supportive from the standpoint of wanting to support the city's efforts to reach net zero uh, in the thermal sector and in the ground transportation sector, which are the two biggest sectors of emissions in the state of Vermont, um, having it go towards emissions reductions in you know, either of all of those sectors is something that we see value in. Right? And so, and so I'm I'm supportive, but less supportive than I understood. Otherwise, it might be only because I understand the fiscal challenges the city has as well. And this is like one of many tools we can use to solve. That's right. Solve the problem. So those those are my my comments. Okay. So I, I'm looking at. Uh, Line 72, this is in subsection B, which is in, in 8 77, um, and it's uh, subsection C of that. that that's the, the definitions section. And um, on a very practical level, as I think about this, um, I, I am seeing some implementation issues. Somebody comes in to get their building permitted and they see they, 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 they've got something that fits the above um, in the above list. Sure. And then and they they get a permit and they build. And then we some we subsequently find that there is an issue. Uh, that seems to be on an implementation basis for a permit, very problematic. And 
Well, the, the fee being charged is at the time of permit. So we don't really have a mechanism in this policy outside of the permit context. So I would assume, although maybe you're suggesting it could be clarified, that uh, you operate under the rules that are in place at the time of your permit. It would be unfair essentially to go back to an applicant. Yeah, but the problem is that this builds in a look back in in the future. In other words, I that's where the subsequently deemed by the utility to not satisfy the carbon intensity requirements. I see. I, so, I think that so I, 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 I think that there's work that we need to do from the standpoint of looking at it from the permitting process and that, that's a process which in any of these bigger buildings and this will will take a, a while mm -hmm. um but this language i think will lead um to problems in terms of in, in terms of its implementation if we have if um we we grant a permit then stuff is happening and it may be even that afterwards somebody says or then you know it, I, 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 I ran the, you know the code enforcement office for you know for almost two years right and it's um it's sort of set it and forget it I give you the permit right I'll come and I look and I'll, I'll I'll um and I'll uh, I'll uh, inspect at the end everything looks according to the code right so let me just say that i think that this piece from that standpoint needs more needs more work and to be able to to build into into this process a really clear thing not just for the regulators but also for the public yeah so, to be crystal clear i wasn't reading this in the way that if you had a permit and your renewable fuel was qualified at the time you were permitted, that the city would go back and, and retroactively change your condition. Uh, this was, I think, intended to be that each year um, or, or, or more frequently, potentially, um, the department is able to update what is qualified based on any new analysis that's been done, but it would apply prospectively to new applicants. Now, that may not be the way you know, you were thinking of it, um, and there could definitely be clarifying language added to ensure that it's implemented. So I, I think that we need to, to clarify this short because this can prep this compresses that whole thing. This is when, you know, when I am advising my owner of the building that, you know, we're going to be doing this and this is what the law yep. says, or I'm advising the building inspector i'm saying you know okay let's go and look at at this sure we need to to be really clear um and that sort of leads me to the reason that we've got green hydrogen sourced in here is what why 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 is it listed as uh, as a fuel that uh, uh two reasons i would say one this list is intended to be and if you read uh, uh the, the clean heat legislation you'll see this is intended to be very much uh in symmetry with the clean heat definitions and so uh green hydrogen sourced exclusively from renewable energy sources is i believe consistent with where the clean heat standard is uh, secondly, this is, again, we're future-proofing a little bit here. There is not uh, a significant supply of green hydrogen that I'm aware of at the moment. Uh, when we say exclusive from renewable energy sources, you're talking about something where somebody might produce hydrogen using uh, solar electricity or wind electricity or hydroelectricity or something like that and be able to use it as a thermal energy resource. Um, if it was produced from fossil fuels, it wouldn't count here. Uh, that's what's called blue hydrogen, as I understand the terminology. Uh, we're talking here about green hydrogen. The Federal Inflation Reduction Act included significant incentives to try to drive towards production of green hydrogen. Uh, if it becomes a viable resource uh, that people could look at, it would have potential applicability, as I understand it, in more industrial scale energy use situations where currently we have fewer options and electrification may be less of an option. So it seems like we should have it on the table. Um, but 
it, consistent with the clean heat process, if it was determined at some point in the future that it wasn't uh, reaching the environmental footprint that was you know, intended, uh, it could be excluded from the clean heat standard and excluded from Burlington's policy. And, and this is a, it's a drop in, so to speak, uh, fuel. So it's, it's not going to be a system on its own. I think it could be both potentially, but I think what we're talking about would be uh, it can be blended in with natural gas uh, in a system. Um, there is also discussions around, you know, fuel cell technology and other things uh, that could be more of a campus-based approach. So uh, my paper addresses that. Sorry to interrupt. It can be blended in only in very small quantities. If you want to use it pure, you need new pipelines, new appliances. So, it's a it's not so, a so I so um given this, and I, I I appreciate the reason to sort of future proof, so to speak, but given the reality, of, I'm, I'm reminded of our zoning amendment process where you know we are often, oh, this new thing come up, now we got to think about it. We, we do a zoning amendment. Um that this seems to not be something that we need to put in into this and i would and i'm, I'm not going to make any amendments now i'm just going to say where, where i'm leaning is to uh, to take this out of the out of this this ordinance um as as it goes through now um the uh the advanced wood heating system, which is the next thing, this is on line 54 and 56. Um, remind us of sort of why it is in the definition of uh, a renewable fuel which reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Certainly. So again, consistency with the state clean heat standard. It's it's included in the state clean heat standard and this uh, incentive program from the state, which sets certain standards for making sure you have modern efficiency standards, pollution controls. Uh, to be clear, I don't see a large use of uh, you know wood pellet or or heating systems of similar uh, you know uh, characterization in Burlington, uh, particularly in new construction. Uh, it's possible there might be a use case somewhere. I, I know for a fact that there are some folks that use uh, wood heat in their homes, whether they have a fireplace or whether they have a, a pellet system. Uh, it is renewable. Um, uh, we could argue the, the debate, but um, at least in the state context, uh, it's considered a fuel that on a life cycle basis reduces emissions compared to fossil fuels. Um, and I would point out that online, this was something that we talked about, uh, on line 197 through 201, we're adding in here a requirement that is beyond what is just being talked about for the carbon fee policy, saying anybody, regardless of the carbon fee policy, who applies uh, for a new or existing building, regardless of size, so this would apply to any building, this sort of outside of the policy uh, that we're debating here, uh, seeking to use a wood chip or pellet heating system would have to demonstrate that it meets these standards or any subsequently issued standards by the state. So you're actually going above and beyond and saying, uh, from here on out, anyone using a new uh, wood system in a building in Burlington has to meet the most current state standards uh, to be eligible for incentives, uh, which means efficiency and air pollution, air emission standards. So um, it's included in both contexts, um, both the carbon fee context and outside of that context. And to just to, to be clear on this, it's in the section on the definitions up in the uh, 40, uh, so it, it, in the uh, line yep. 54. Correct. Um, because that, because it's going to have a relationship with the, um, with a fee. Correct. Correct. How, how is it going to have a related, a relationship with the fee? It, 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 you know, like, What's the system that this is going to be a part of, but it's going to be a, a, a fossil fuel system? No, uh, this will never be a fossil fuel system. Right. Um, this would be if you were putting in a pellet boiler, for example, um, these can operate at fairly high efficiencies. Um, 
or a uh, wood chip boiler, for example, uh, which might be, you know, you can use them in a residential context, but more often you're going to be looking at a commercial context. A uh, number of schools around Vermont have relatively high efficiency uh, wood pellet or wood chip systems. Uh, they've been used in countries like Austria for a long period of time as a means of getting away from fossil fuels. And so these systems are not replacing fossil fuels in a fossil fuel system. They are a wood only uh, technology. And being as such, they wouldn't be subject to the fee in any case. Right. I think we're prescribing some standards to say, if you want this to be a part of uh, your building, you're going to have to meet the state's uh, most modern efficiency standards and air emission standards. So given that we have put in 197 lines and 197 to 201, as you were saying, this exact thing, the exact requirement, so that regardless of uh, who is going to put it in, and it's not a fossil fuel, it's going to be subject to the fee anyway. Um, that uh, I don't really see the efficacy of putting it under the, um, the, the, the one up top, so to speak. Well, I, I guess my only argument would be um, you know, again, we would be consistent with the state, but also. Uh, effectively, you don't pay the fee, and it would be, regardless of whether you put it there or not, it's not something that would be subject to the fee. Right. So for the benefit of the applicant who's going to be looking through a list of what can I use, uh, to not have it there could create confusion. Um, to not have it as a listed, uh, a listed technology uh, could create confusion, potentially, because it, it's not subject to the fee uh, in any respect. You and know, here we're I, kind of at a list of things that are not subject to the fee. Yeah, I I don't know that I would. Uh, although, although we do do that similarly for other things like uh, the solar, water heating, or electric powered. So I mean, okay. So I see that I, I I'm inclined to uh, to remove it. Uh, let me let because I'm monopolizing, and I'm sorry on this uh, on line. 60 again. You were explained 60 through 65, which is the renewable gas. You were explaining the, not the molecule, not following the milk molecule, but um, following the um, uh, this process for for I don't know. Um, certification or something like that. So, um, are you, are you saying, and I doubt that this language will require that all of the the gas that would go to power a thermal system in a in a building in Burlington being built under this requirement, um, all the renewable, all the gas would have to be renewable and it, 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 that amount of gas would consistently and continually have to be um renewable um gas couldn't be a mixture you know in other words not like 50 percent of it is coming from the farm and you know 50 of it's just coming from the general Vermont gas system. So, you know, just to be clear, the policy is a appliance by appliance, uh, heating system by heating system policy. So somebody could opt to comply for one appliance and not for and pay the fee for another. So I just want to clarify okay. that. Uh, within that, though, if somebody was using renewable gas to qualify, uh, there's fairly clear language here um, that talks about the need for it to be either one of two things. Either they have a lifetime contract for the length of the lifetime expected of the system that they're putting in ahead of time for the renewable gas, which is unlikely, that doesn't typically exist, or more likely, uh, they have an annual certification that shows that they are purchasing the quantity of renewable gas that's needed for that appliance or system. If at any point they stop doing that, the fee then applies to them on a prorated basis for the remaining life of that system. Uh, so that's exactly right. Um, as you kind of uh, just described it, um, you know, you would not be able to uh, to do that uh, halfway. And I think I can point to the uh, language here is on 
uh, page, uh, or sorry, line 145, um, which talks about for compliance purposes for systems that are capable of using a fossil or renewable fuel that reduces emissions, um, that you have to have the contract demonstrating that it's fully sourced for the life of the system, which is unlikely, or an annual compliance certification. And it makes clear that if you use that option and you fail to provide the annual certification in any year, uh, then the, you will immediately be assessed the alternative compliance fee for the pro rata share of the remainder of the system. If you miss it just once, you're out. You're then going to pay the fee for the remaining life of the system. You don't even get to come back in, essentially. So it's a strike, one strike, you're out policy here. So and, uh, I'm just sorry for one last thing, yeah. just last. And, and it's not no, really and, this, and it's just to, to say this system that we're building is very different than the other building um, ordinance um, system that we've got in place, which is a um, asset permit, build it, get it inspected, you got a permit, you're done, we don't look back and say we changed the rules, blah, blah. There, there is an ongoing aspect of administration on this. And um, I'm glad we've got this here. This is the most that I've really, since I worked with you, but I'm now thinking, I wanna make sure, we need to make sure that in law and in structure, in, in bureaucracy, in administration, we are set up to do this because this is very different. This is not anything that permitting and inspections is, is looking at. This is almost more akin to it being a utility and you know having these ongoing obligations to look at. So I, I just wanted to raise that as a as a flag that we need to make sure we're taking care of because the worst thing that we can do is to build something that does not work. So I just want to, to add some point of my um, meeting order. We have a tour that we've scheduled and now we're, we're about at least a half an hour late on it, almost a half an hour late on that. So I'm, no, no, don't be said this is important work. So my question to the committee is, do we want to allow? Do we want to? Do we want to still do that tonight? Um, because we're starting late, um, or do we want to release uh, Corey and anyone else who's going to um, accompany us on this tour? Okay, it depends on how how long, much longer we want to deliberate on this ordinance tonight, and um, how much time we want to take afterwards. It is productive for me to hear Darren answer yeah. these questions. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I would be okay with scheduling another meeting. I mean, I have the and and, and, or, or the, and, or the and, tour. No, no. I think you know if we could set up a, 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 another special meeting that would uh, continue to continue this. Would, would you be open? Oh, of course, uh, you know, schedule the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I just um, and I I hate to interrupt the flow of the conversation, but just in terms of timekeeping, I, I I'm sorry. You, you didn't getting, go, you're getting you didn't, kinky. You didn't do anything wrong. Kinky here. There's something to be sorry about. Um, we just we always pack too much into our two meetings, as it turns out. We should learn some better uh, better scheduling skills. Um, so I don't want. To, I didn't mean to interrupt your train of thought. So if you want to finish this, I yeah, I know I. I sort of got there and, and in the, this is helping me figure out how this thing works. And I mean, like, this is fairly revelatory to me as I'm thinking through the, the, the process. Um, Do we want to try to schedule another meeting right now? I would, I would, I would be inclined to want to do that. Um, and it would be just for the purposes of continuing this item. Um, so, shall we? I guess let's just do that. Um, what is your preference next week? So, I am gone the 
and I have to sub in on a committee for Joan on the second, so I can't do the second through the nine. Okay. That actually coincides with my problem, but I, I could do the first. I have meetings on the second and the third. Why not have them on the first? First is the second. Is that Tuesday? Yeah. Why not? I think it's a week from now. It's a week from tonight. I can do that too. Is the meeting scheduled here? Here? Yeah, I don't know if um, we could move in the meeting space or. I can confirm, but yeah, sure. I would be open to doing it at BED. Um, and I don't, just for the public who may be critical, I don't find there to be a um, a conflict with us meeting there and we have a shortage of uh, of spaces. So it's a nice room. It's a community space. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll make sure it's available. It's I will make sure it's available. And if it's not, we can find an alternative. It won't happen tonight, but I'll. Do you have one of these uh, magic projectors? Yes. We do. Okay. Yeah, so. We do. Not quite that big, but yes. Okay. So I was going to say, we also have a pusher if we didn't potentially. No, we, we certainly can. Uh, we, we can use that. Okay. We'll confirm, but uh, we'll so tentatively hold for Monday. For, or for sorry, five, Tuesday. Tuesday, 5 p.m. At 5 p.m. Yeah. So, yeah. The chair and pressure conference is open. So do you want me to just book that preemptively? Oh. Or if it looks what? like Sparks is open. And from what I can tell. It looks like spark space. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't matter to me. It's easier for me to ride my bike to push here than it is. Sure it is. Yes. 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 Why is that just up the street? It's at City Hall. Oh, City, City Hall. Hall. City Hall. Oh. Okay. We take push here on the first at five o'clock to continue Perfect. our discussion. Yay, Maddie. Thank you, everybody. Okay. If the public gets to come to that group, or almost or every developer meetings are public. Uh, I, I mean, we're just going to, it's going to be, I guess it's not, I guess, yeah. Well, if, if we recess and the answer is no, if the, if we have a new meeting, we have to work, we have to board it, the answer is yes. And I, I am in favor of hearing, you know, like things to help us work through this myself, but, you know. I, I, I am as well. Um, I just, uh, again, it's like we... Uh, we're trying to manage our work totally. with um, with um, with also hearing from the public. So I um, yeah, let's let's just we'll warn it as a new meeting because we still have some other things to do here. Too. I, I think that um, having a new meeting and having it uh, having public comment on this, this ordinance, yeah, which is allowed That's by true. law. Okay. Um, very good. We we don't use it. We don't do that very often. But. Okay, so no McNeil. With that in mind, we will recess the stop. No, no McNeil talk on this. Let's <laughs> control <laughs> ourselves. We're going to uh, <laughs> the next item on our agenda here. Thank, Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Next week. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> okay. Um, the next is council councilor updates. Are there any? Um, I went on the before it the great time. Great. Um, yeah, I went the day, the Friday before, with uh, Joe Nelson and um, Ethan Stafford. Um, uh, he's the Jimmy County State section. He really uh, informative. I know Jimmy. We're going to do that tomorrow, and I'm going to actually go to the same place because the roads up in Jefferson will are washed out. Is <laughs> And it's it's a cool spot. So nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It was it was important to me. One of the things that I might take away is um, the kind of sort of very intentional forestry that's being done to, um, as one of the public commenters last night said, try to recreate conditions of old growth forest in like a very compressed time frame without yeah. waiting for it to happen. Sort of the yeah. from that. By keeping certain trees and keeping certain structure in the forest. Um, so yeah, that was interesting. Plus, uh, um, the other thing that was uh, notable for me was that uh, Ethan had this um, this this knack for identifying the birds Bird. that were around. Yeah, it's so, so very cool. nice. Yeah, no, I, I I'm looking forward to to doing that tomorrow. Excellent. Wow.
That was my only comment. So I think we need to, uh, speaking of full, um, full agendas, is have a follow up on, you know, with the yes. uh, guard and then put that in the, uh, in the hopper. Um, we're gonna, yeah, we're having the airport come next, um, or, or not during our August meeting. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Okay. And so um, I was going to, even though we haven't had time to process everything from last night yet, um, that was on my, um, was going to be my outreach or collaboration with Maddie to see if we might be able to get, get um, Nick and or someone from the guard. I think, and really that would be my desire. Yeah. You know. Have, have you made that connection with them? I'll leave. I mean, I, I yeah. made that connection. I talked. I talked to uh, Major Smith at the guard uh, before, and I think she's the person I would reach out to. Well, that would be great. I think that we need to to to, to follow up on that. Um, that would be enough. And uh, we also have also kind of follow-ups. We still have. Um, a pending um, resolution at the council level on the roundabout commemoration. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fa I failed on that. No, no, you didn't. I'm just I'm putting a gentle reminder. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 people think people are talking. You can, you can, you can absolutely and totally. I am not going to do that. You can I'm going to say that it's coming. Okay. So as Christmas, those are the. Is there are there other councilor updates? So our next non-ordinance two meeting is scheduled for 822. Um, is that good for that works for everybody still? Yep. Okay. Yep. And so the next thing then is our Champlain Parkway walkthrough, and we'll have to adjourn after that. Right. We can maybe adjourn there. We can adjourn there, maybe. We can we can kind of <laughs> Okay, if you say so. We're taking, we're taking this up. Anybody in the public, you, you can come. Where are we going? We're going to go look at the Champlain Parkway. And where are we meeting? So that oh, people I, I have to, we have to find uh, Corey. It might be waiting for us out there. There's Corey. Yep. So where where would we be going? Uh, well, it's kind of up to, like I said, the discussion of where we want to kind of talk about through things. Um, obviously, we're at 645 Pines. We can start here and start working south down the alignment. Okay. That's where most of the work is currently that. going and what's going to be getting finished in this initial construction contract. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is there anything else we need to do in this room? I don't think so. I need to close up. Zoom. I guess um, I guess we'll say goodbye to everybody watching remotely. Um, and just to remind anybody who's watching, we'll be continuing our discussion of the ordinance uh, that we were discussing tonight on August 1st at 5 p.m. in the Sharon Busher conference room at City Hall. Thanks. You said our meeting in August is a, a later one is the 22nd or the 29th? 22nd. 22nd. Thank you.